On the far edge of Portland, Maine, where John Ford was born, there's a shoreline park called the Eastern Promenade. Locals call it the Prom. They come here to jog or bike or walk their dogs on a path along the water. Mostly, though, they just sit and stare. That's because beyond the sailboats and past the tiny islands just off the coast, the horizon looks like it goes on forever. John Ford spent a long time staring out at that horizon as a kid, breathing in the scent of salt and seaweed. I enjoyed the sea very, very much. If you're at sea, you're free. So years later, in 1934, when Ford had a little money, he bought himself a boat. More accurately, a yacht, though Ford refused to call it that. A yacht was too Hollywood. He named his not a yacht the Ariner, after the Aran Islands in Ireland where his grandmother was from. Being on the Ariner meant you were in Ford's special little group, his inner circle. He called the group the Emerald Bay Yacht Club. Its motto, the Yacht Club for people who don't like yacht clubs. The Ariner became the centerpiece for nearly every part of John Ford's life. It was his home away from home, his floating office, Sometimes, he even used it for classified military operations. We'll get to that. Often, though, it was a party boat, a place to gather with his closest friends, like those two football players he met on his 1929 film, Salute, John Wayne, or Duke, and Ward Bond. Duke Wayne, Ward Bond, and I were sort of a threesome. We played cards together, swam together, drank together, and was three very close friends. I was aboard the boat for Christ's sakes as much as he was. In case you don't recognize the voice, that's John Wayne. We go out on his boat and maybe stay for two or three weeks, and maybe we'd say hello at breakfast time or maybe at lunch, but it didn't depend on continuous conversation. John Wayne spent so much time on the Ariner that after Wayne got famous, People assumed it was his boat. So there's the Ariner, there's John Wayne's boat. That's John Wayne up there now. Jack would get up. It's not John Wayne's boat, it's John Ford's boat. I'm sitting there laughing. Sometimes Ford's daughter Barbara would find her father and Wayne playing a card game called Honeymoon Bridge. So one day I came down and I said, why do you call it Honeymoon Bridge? And Daddy says, because we're trying to screw each other. Actor Henry Fonda says, along with the cards, the fishing, the swimming, and the drinking, there was also live music aboard the Ariner. He loved the mariachis, you know, and when you were in Mexico with him on the boat, he had them aboard. When I think John Ford, I don't think mariachis, but Ford was apparently obsessed with them always with the mariachis following him. He would bring them aboard and they would, they would play on the deck or even down in the saloon. With mariachis trailing them, they would wander into towns along the Mexican coast. He was a good companion to be with, to go ashore with him and to do the rounds. Sometimes they were the rounds of the whorehouses, you know, not for sex even, just because it was colorful, and you'd have drinks in them, and they would go to, from bar to bar, because he was always drinking when you were on those trips. And when Ford dragged himself back to the boat to recover, he didn't hole up in the captain's suite. He used to live like one of the crew on the boat. This is John Wayne's son, Michael. He lived in a little tiny place, you know, like you'd walk down an aisleway, and then there'd be a bunk right there, and that's where he lived. Instead of living like a major director, he lived like a spy. That is an interesting choice of words, because, strangely enough, Ford was, in fact, using his not a yacht for exactly that, to spy for the U.S. government. I was going on a trip down to the Mexican coast of Scabbins Lagoon. It was a difficult place to get into. This was just three years before the start of World War II, The U.S. was afraid Japan might send spies out on fishing boats off the West Coast. Ford spent half his time out in those waters, 
So a Navy connection of his reached out, asked Ford to keep an eye out for anything suspicious. He did. And one day, there in that Mexican lagoon, John Ford spotted a Japanese boat. We took a small boat one in. There was a scientist walking the patient. I found a uh, copy of a Japanese newspaper. So we gave conclusive proof that the Japanese had been in there and were using it for some purpose. Ford reported back to Naval Intelligence, told them what he'd found. Ford had long wanted to be in the military. This was his first taste of it, the beginning of a tug of war for John Ford between his two loves. On one hand, the movies, his art, his boys club, his paycheck. On the other, the military, the chance to serve his country, to stand proud in a uniform, to be part of the action instead of just directing it. As it turned out, he used one to get to the other. John Ford did make his way into the military, but to get there, he had to conquer Hollywood first. I'm your host, Ben Mankiewicz. You're listening to Season 5 of The Plot Thickens, a podcast from Turner Classic Movies. Each season, we bring you an in-depth story about the movies and the people who make them. This season, we partnered with Novel for Decoding John Ford, the most influential filmmaker of the last hundred years. This is Episode 2, The Ariner. By the 1930s, Ford had some success under his belt. What he didn't have was an Oscar. That was about to change. In 1932, Ford came across a novel called The Informer. I just read a story by my cousin, Liam O'Flaherty, an Irish writer. By the way, this is actually true. Liam O'Flaherty was Ford's cousin. His novel was like a bingo card of all of Ford's interests. It's set during a war, a war in Ireland, the Irish War for Independence. Naturally, as a first-generation Irishman, I was interested. So something very near and dear to my heart. And I had been to Ireland during the Troubles, so I was conversant with what the IRA were and all their method. Ford was hooked. He decided to adapt the book into a movie. He invited a screenwriter friend named Dudley Nichols to join him on the Ariner, and the two turned the boat into their working office. Dudley got up at 5.30 in the morning, went fishing alone. By that time, the Marlin were alive and hungry. They fished all day. Nichols was a former newspaper man who wrote fast and well. He had served in the Navy during World War I and had some Irish in his blood. No wonder Ford liked him. After a long day of fishing, Dudley Nichols would leave the marlin behind and dive into the screenplay. In the evening, I could hear him tapping on his typewriter, finish the script as far as we could go. A few weeks later, when they docked in the resort town of Acapulco, Mexico, Nichols brought forward the finished script. He says, I didn't do a good job. He says, I think I fished too much and wrote too little. But Ford liked it. He joked they wrote better when they were a little seasick. The studio liked it too. So the Ariner quickly sailed back to Los Angeles so Ford could start production on The Informer. Ford cast a beefy British actor named Victor McLaughlin to play the lead, a hard-drinking Irishman who informs the British police where they can find a fugitive Irish soldier. He does it for the reward money, 20 pounds. I didn't know what I was doing, Dad. I didn't know what I was doing. Ford shot the entire movie in just over a month, working fast, but still taking artistic risks. Ford used deep shadows to mirror the internal conflict of the main character. What are you talking about, informant for? Oh. Who's an informer? He pretty much created a film noir before anyone knew what film noir was. That's the one that informed on Frankie McPhillip. 
I saw him and he knows it. It's a lie! It's a lie! That's The Informer came out in May 1935. When a group of New York film critics screened it, they did something unusual. They burst into applause. Then they voted the Informer the best picture of the year. The praise turned the movie into a moneymaker. It was a landmark for me. Because I've been doing cheap stories, and this thing at least I got great critical acclaim. With The Informer, Ford won his first Oscar for Best Director. It also won Best Adapted Screenplay for Dudley Nichols and Best Actor for Victor McLaughlin. From there, Ford's career picked up steam. He began making two or three big movies a year, all types of movies. He directed Catherine Hepburn in a costume drama called Mary of Scotland. So the first step to prove me guilty is to murder those who would prove me innocent. He made a highly regarded disaster adventure, The Hurricane. Ravenous falling, I tell you! Jean, you must listen! I'll listen to one voice only, my own. He even made a movie with an actress no one associates with John Ford, Shirley Temple. Their film is called Wee Willie Winky. How can I get to be a soldier? You? Really? It's important. Still, there was one genre missing. Ford had cut his teeth on westerns in the 1920s. He hadn't made one in over a decade. But in 1937, Ford came across a western he believed in. He didn't know it at the time, but the project would lead to one of the most important and complicated relationships in his life. Though it nearly didn't happen. They all refused to have anything to do with the picture. No we were touching. Months earlier, Ford's 16-year-old son, Pat, brought him an idea for a film. Pat had been reading a short story in Collier's magazine about a band of unlikely travel companions making their way through dangerous territory in a horse-drawn stagecoach. Pat told his father he thought it would make a great movie. Ford agreed and enlisted his old fishing pal, Dudley Nichols, to write the screenplay. They called the movie Stagecoach. Though Ford and Nichols were each Oscar winners for The Informer, producer after producer turned them down, all for the same reason. You can't do a Western. I mean, who look at them? Westerns are a dead issue. It was the first American genre, really, and it survived all throughout the 20s, and finally at about 1930, it becomes a B picture. That's Scout Tafoya, who's written extensively about Ford. Westerns had become the domain of low-budget studios by the 1930s. The movies ended up in Saturday matinees or as the second film in a double feature. The major studios had just moved on from Westerns. They wanted dramas, they wanted crime pictures, they wanted anything else because A, those won awards, B, audiences wanted to see them, and C, they said something. It's very rare that you're going to find a Western that truly seems like somebody has done something completely new with it. But Ford rejected this idea. He kept telling producers to look past the genre to the story. You know, this is not a Western, this is a fine story. Story of great, great character. For a different filmmaker, this might have been the end of the story. Not John Ford. He loved proving people wrong. He just kept shopping Stagecoach until he finally got a yes. An independent producer named Walter Wanger was a huge fan of The Informer. He offered to pay for Stagecoach, just for the chance to work with John Ford. What fascinating stories there were in the life of the Stagecoach. And in the lives of these American frontier characters, John Ford has created a truly great motion picture. Stagecoach. Stagecoach became a massive hit. It was nominated for seven Oscars, winning two. Orson Welles said he watched Stagecoach on repeat before making Citizen Kane. Stagecoach was so popular in part because of the sophisticated technique behind its action scenes, a technique executed almost entirely by one man, Yakima Kanut. Knut was a former rodeo cowboy who did stunts for decades in Hollywood. Here's Scott McGee, my 
colleague at TCM who wrote a book about stunt work. He had developed a lot of best practices of how to make stunts safe, cheap, and effective for the camera. Together, Knut and Ford developed a groundbreaking stunt for Stagecoach. The scene has Apache warriors on horseback chasing the stagecoach, carrying passengers across the salt flats of Utah. The stagecoach is being pulled by six horses. Yakima Kanut is dressed as one of the Apaches, and he jumps from his galloping horse onto the stagecoach horses, which are also at full gallop. Then he's shot at and falls. He grabs the crossbar between the horses, hovering inches above the ground, moving at a frightening speed. And Yakima Knut, as the stuntman, hangs there and is dragged underneath the horses, between the horses, at full speed. He lets go, and then the stagecoach kind of runs over him safely. When you see that stunt in stagecoach, it just looks like a guy's doing the stunt for real, because he is. Because he is. That's Ford biographer Scott Iman. There's no special effects here. There's no harnesses that are going to lift him up in case something goes wrong. And that reality, physical reality, emotional reality, is something that's present in John Ford's work all the time. The stagecoach stunt is a combination of skill, bravery, and maybe a touch of insanity. Nobody who saw it could forget it. It's why Steven Spielberg used it in Raiders of the Lost Ark with a modern twist. In Raiders, horses would be replaced by a five-ton truck. Harrison Ford's stunt double, Terry Leonard, came up with the idea and presented it to Steven Spielberg. He said, there's a stunt that I tried to do that I was actually copying Yakima Knut the famous stunt in Stagecoach, where he went under all the horses and the covered wagon. Is there any way you can add a stunt where I go under the truck and come back out to the site? That's exactly what they did. A terrific movie moment and a perfect homage to Stagecoach. Though the stunts in Stagecoach are impressive, arguably the most important thing to come out of the film was its lead actor. Stagecoach marked the first time this actor played a significant role in a John Ford film. It became the spark that ignited a lifelong collaboration. The time gave me to Stagecoach, I thought about Duke. Not many people were thinking about Duke Wayne at this moment in Hollywood. He'd been in roughly 80 films, a lot of small roles, and some leads in quick, cheap westerns. He was hardly an obvious choice for the leading man in a John Ford film. Moreover, Ford hadn't worked with Wayne in eight years, though they had remained good friends. Here's John Wayne, who, like a lot of people in Hollywood, called Ford Jack. I never expected anything from Jack, and I'm sure that he knew that. You know, he knew that mine was a friendship and not a desire to get anything out of On a hot summer day in 1937, as they were hanging out on board the Ariner, Ford told Wayne about Stagecoach, about why he thought it would make a great picture. Ford was luring Wayne in, hoping he'd want to play the lead. He said, well, uh, geez, I got a great story here. You want to read I read it, it's a little short story. He said, who the hell in this business can play that part? Wayne did not get the hint. He started suggesting other actors. I said, there's only one guy, Lloyd Nolan, that played in Two for Texas or some goddamn thing. I said, have you seen that picture? He said, no. Never a patient man, John Ford finally stopped beating around the bush. He said, for Christ's sakes, couldn't you play it? He says, <laughs> knock me up. Of course, John Wayne agreed, if only to avoid arguing with Ford. There was one problem, though. 
Ford's money man, producer Walter Wanger, wanted a big name for the lead. Wanger suggested Gary Cooper, a stoic actor who was a real Montana cowboy before becoming a movie star. Ford fought for Wayne and fought hard. He said at the time, the backers don't want him, the producer doesn't want him, I want him. John Wayne became the Ringo Kid. Hey, look, it's Ringo. About 20 minutes into Stagecoach, the audience gets its first glimpse of the Ringo Kid. A horse-led stagecoach is rolling through the desert when a shot rings out. John Wayne is standing alone in the desert, wearing a Stetson cowboy hat, a bandana around his neck, and in one hand, he's twirling a six-shooter rifle. Watching this moment on screen, you can almost feel the spark, the special alchemy of John Wayne and John Ford coming together. It's as if this is the exact moment they hitched their stars to each other. As Wayne twirls his rifle, the camera pushes in on him, giving us a rarity for a John Ford film at the time, a tight close-up on John Wayne's face. As if John Ford was telling the world, keep an eye on this John Wayne guy. Didn't expect to see you riding shotgun on this run, Marshal. With this one shot, John Wayne becomes a movie star. You're the notorious Ringo kid. Friends just call me Ringo. Nickname I had as a kid. Right name's Henry. Wayne was the focus of every scene. Scott Iman again. Wayne's response was the focus of every scene, his reaction, the character of the Ringo kid's reaction. Looks like I got the plague, don't it? And if you watch the film, all the other characters are watching the Ringo kid to see how he reacts. Ringo! Wayne understood that what Ford was doing was throwing him the film. And it put Wayne on a wholly different plateau, and he never really looked back. So at bottom, Wayne believed he owed Ford more than he could ever repay. Stagecoach reinvigorated the Western, and it put John Wayne right in the middle of the Hollywood map. But as Wayne learned, there's always a price to pay with John Ford. Coming up, John Ford makes John Wayne's life a living hell. Oh, man, son of a bitch. Jeez, I was so fucking mad at him, I could have killed him. John Ford seemed to have an allergic reaction to his own generosity. If he was nice, he'd immediately do the opposite. It's the Ringo Kid. This is something John Wayne quickly discovered on the set of Stagecoach. There's a scene in the movie where the Ringo Kid steps off the stagecoach into the hot sun and walks over to a bucket to wash his face. And I say, when I go with you, Sheriff, you know, I get about halfway through the scene up in the foreground. It's a cut. Ford walked over to Wayne and laid into him. He didn't like how Wayne was washing his face in the scene. Say, for Christ's sakes, wash your face. Don't you ever wash it at home, you know? He says, you're daubing your face. You're daubing your face. Shit, I was throwing all your mad son of a bitch. Jeez, I was so fucking mad at him, I could have killed him. <laughs> Ford was so mean to Wayne, it made everyone else mad, too. And he got the whole cast hating him for doing it. To where finally even Tim Holt, the young <laughs> kid, is saying, God damn it, you quit picking on Duke like that. John Wayne was learning what many before him already knew and many after would soon discover. For all of his genius and generosity, John Ford was a bully. It seemed to be part of Ford's idea of how a man in charge should act. Ford was obsessed with that idea, what it means to be a man. 
and he projected that obsession into his films. Catherine Hepburn pointed this out to him in a conversation they had late in his life. What happened to you in, in your work, in your career, was that the subjects that interested you were really practically 100% masculine. Of all the actors who ever worked for Ford, no one understood him better than Catherine Hepburn. I spent a lot of time analyzing your character. <laughs> Ford and Hepburn made only one movie together, but they were extremely close. So close, there were rumors they had an affair, though neither ever confirmed it. You can hear their chemistry in these tapes. Hepburn brought out a playful side of Ford he usually kept hidden. I think we had fundamental respect for each other. Mm-hmm. And I think that is the most lasting quality in the world. I think I that think... And the fact that you beat the hell out of me at golf. <laughs> well, that nearly finished our friendship. That <laughs> God nearly <laughs> needs it. Ford hated to talk about himself. He flat out refused to self-analyze. You're very secretive about the personal things in your life. So are you. Well, we're secretive New Englanders. But you're much worse than I am. Hepburn seemed to understand what made Ford tick, which meant she understood the male characters he crafted on screen. Men who were hyper-macho, but also surprisingly sensitive. That type of male that is that sort of over-masculine, you know, pretended to be very tough and was always talking about fighting in the hair on his chest and everything else, you know. Tough guy uh, was easily thrown totally by a word. Totally thrown by a word. That line makes me wonder. Is Hepburn really talking about Ford's characters here? Or is she hinting at John Ford himself, the tough guy who hides his sensitive side? More often than not, when Ford cast this tough guy on screen, it was John Wayne he plugged into the role. Take the Ringo Kid in Stagecoach. You might need me in this Winchester, Curly. The Ringo Kid is protective and loyal. He rarely says more than he has to. Wayne's character may not say much, but he does carry a big gun, and he's not afraid to use it. Be three against one in Lord's Road. Well, there's some things a man just can't run away from. The Ringo Kid is looking for revenge, out to kill the man who murdered his father and brother. Revenge was one of the many macho ideals Ford crafted on screen that he himself employed off screen. Ford was not a man to forgive and forget, even when it came to family. A few months after Stagecoach, Ford directed a movie called Drums Along the Mohawk, his first film in color. Trust in the Lord and wait until you can make every shot count. It was a revolutionary war story starring Henry Fonda, who was quickly becoming a Ford favorite. I had to shoot him. There wasn't anything else to do. I had to. (laughs) Further down the cast list was a familiar name, Francis Ford, John Ford's older brother. Over the years, the roles between Big Brother and Little Brother had reversed. As John's star rose, Francis's fell. John was now giving Francis bit parts in movies instead of the other way around. Over and over again, John Ford had him play the character of the town drunk. You drink liquor, Sam? No. Historian Kathy Fuller Seeley says it's hard to know whether John and Francis were close. Francis mentions John one sentence in a 350-page autobiography, but Francis Ford would not have been in 30 of John Ford films if there hadn't been that deep family bond. So I think both a healthy rivalry, but also a deep family bond. Certainly there was a bond, but there was also a grudge. It was clear John was still upset over how Francis used and abused him as a stunt double during John's early days making silent films in Hollywood. Francis had put his younger brother 
in dangerous situations. Once he had a grenade explode on John. Another time, John had to take a huge leap from a moving train. Before that jump, John turned to Francis and said, You will owe me. And years later, during Drums Along the Mohawk, John made Francis pay up. He cast Francis as Joe, a loony old hermit. He has one standout scene. Ammunition's mighty low, Lord. I go Fort Dayton for help. That's a job no, for I me, Joe. <laughs> I know every foot of the way. If anybody can make it, I can. Joe. Francis's character gets captured during a battle scene and ends up splayed in a cart of hay with his arms tied to a wooden beam. Arrows of fire are shot into the cart, causing it to go up in flames. While the camera rolled on the scene, John watched as the fire crept closer and closer to his brother. Only when it started to burn the ties around Francis's wrists did John finally yell cut and call for the fire extinguishers. Oh, merciful Father, forgive me for what I am about to. John Ford was the brother with the power now, and he made sure Francis knew it. And as John's power grew, so did his influence, not just on filmmaking, but on American culture. After the break, John Ford makes his most controversial film to date. I'll be everywhere, wherever you can look. Wherever there's a fight so hungry people can eat, I'll be there. By the late 1930s, Ford had made nearly 100 films, 100. These projects often touched on important issues of the day. War, political independence, intolerance, poverty. Off-screen, though, Ford had no interest in discussing any of those issues. Ask him about politics, like this poor BBC interviewer did, and you'd get something like this in return. That's politics. That has nothing to do with pictures. I'd rather, I would rather not discuss it. Oh, that's your question. Still, there were some clues as to how John Ford felt about the state of the world. He spoke at an anti-Nazi rally in 1937 when a government official accused the Anti-Nazi League of being a communist organization. Ford said, if this be communism, count me in. Ford also helped create one of Hollywood's biggest unions, the Screen Directors Guild, now known as the Directors Guild of America, or DGA. But perhaps the best way to understand Ford's off-screen views is to look at what he was doing on screen. Here's John Wayne. He was a private man, and he, he never was so much for a political scene, but he was certainly articulate with that camera. He told his feelings about the world and the community and his friends and his pictures. Ford's movies during this time, the late 1930s, were undeniably progressive. He did not shy away from contentious topics. It might sound strange now, but one of the most controversial films he's made was based on a book you likely read in high school English. Sweeping across the country comes one of the great literary achievements of our time, The Grapes of Wrath. In 1939, Ford was on location shooting drums along the Mohawk when he was approached by Daryl F. Zanuck, who ran production at 20th Century Fox. Zanuck told Ford he'd just bought the rights to The Grapes of Wrath, and he wanted Ford to direct the movie version. Fox paid $70,000 for the rights, about $1.5 million in today's dollars. I can't supply the demand. The John Steinbeck novel had just won the Pulitzer Prize. It was wildly popular. Do you have a copy of Grapes of Wrath? I'm sorry, we're all sold out. The Grapes of Wrath is based on real events. During the Great Depression, a million farm workers were devastated by droughts and dust storms in the Midwest. They packed their belongings 
and headed west. Deserting their farmsteads that had shriveled and powdered and blown away in the wind, these people take pilgrimage to the promised land of plenty, the lush valleys of California. Though the story certainly resonated with millions of Americans, no one wanted to see their own suffering on the big screen. It was a downbeat picture, no glamour in it, a story of poor people fighting for an existence. At that time, that was not the trend. Sex at that time was starting to rear its ugly head, and musicals were in vogue. The 1930s were largely dominated by movie musicals like 42nd Street and Footlight Parade. Out in Hollywood, the sensation of the moment is the picture called 42nd Street, into which Warner Brothers have put stars, girls, beauty, and talent in lavish quantities. They were an escape for audiences living through the devastation of the Depression. Ford wasn't put off by the grim story in The Grapes of Wrath. In fact, it drew him in. He sympathized with the plight of the main characters, the Jode family. He saw parallels with his own Irish heritage. My family, you know, we lived in the legend of the famine. We lived with the legend of the famine, Ford says. My father and mother, they were too young then, but they remembered the uh, horrible situation of the famine. Tough time. So Ford told Daryl Zanuck, yes, he would direct The Grapes of Wrath. But as it turned out, adapting this downbeat story into a successful motion picture would be the least of his problems. The Grapes of Wrath becomes the book of the nation. Everyone, everywhere, joins in the discussion of its vital problems. In the book, John Steinbeck shined a spotlight on the struggles of working men and women. Opponents saw it as pro-communist, Opponents also saw it as anti-American. They claimed it would stoke class warfare. Believe it or not, libraries banned the book. The California Chamber of Commerce condemned it. When 20th Century Fox announced they were making it into a movie, anti-labor groups boycotted the studio. Amid these protests and boycotts, John Ford went to work. He started by choosing a leading actor. If he wanted audiences to look past the controversy, he needed them to connect with the man at the center of the story, Tom Joad. Thankfully, Ford knew just the guy for the job. Tom Joad is played by Henry Fonda. Henry Fonda exuded all-American goodness. Born in Nebraska, Fonda had this soft Midwestern way of talking. The first time he worked with Ford, he played young Abraham Lincoln. In Henry Fonda, John Ford saw decency and honesty. I knew Ford for three pictures. It was my third in a row. This is Henry Fonda. And, you know, it was, uh, it became a love story. I mean, we, we loved each other just, uh, I think, in the way that he loved Duke and, and Ward. A lot of people assumed Hollywood would add glamour to this bleak story, make it more palatable. After all, the novel dealt with a murder, it questioned religion, and it showed some of the worst poverty in American history. Many thought Ford would have to soften that up, but he refused. Ford stayed faithful to the darkness of Steinbeck's novel. He filmed it in black and white, almost in a documentary style. Grapes of Wrath is shot like the, the Depression photographs of Dorothy Lang. That's Ford biographer Scott Iman. The actors aren't wearing makeup. There's no diffusion on the lens. A lot of harsh morning light. It's shot very photorealistic. The way he directed actors was also understated. Ford had a specific approach to getting dramatic performances from his cast. You can see this in the climax of The Grapes of Wrath. Now get out of here. Go down on the willows and wait. I ain't gonna run. Tom Joad is a wanted man. He'd killed a crooked deputy and had to go on the lam. First, though, he has to tell his mother, knowing this will be the last time they ever see each other. Ford decided to shoot this scene toward the end of production, after the actors had bonded and spent weeks shooting one heartbreaking scene after another. Then, when it came time for the emotional climax, 
Ford refused to let his actors rehearse. And we were like racehorses chomping at the bit because he wouldn't let us do it. He deliberately never let us because it was, again, part of the Ford technique of not leaving your performance, you know, like the, like the athlete leading his uh, performance in the, in the locker room. Don't, don't dilute it. Don't spoil it. He wanted it fresh. He loved one take. The day came to shoot the scene between Tom Joad and his mother, played by Jane Darwell. Ford told the crew to set up. His cinematographer was Greg Toland, who went on to shoot Citizen Kane the next year. Here again is Henry Fonda. When finally, technically, Greg Toland and the, and the camera crew and the dolly men were all ready, okay, here we go. How am I going to know about you, Tommy? Why, they could kill you, and I'd never know. They could hurt you. How am I going to know? And for the first time, out loud, Ma Joad and I said those lines. I'll be everywhere, wherever you can look. Wherever there's a fight so hungry people can eat, I'll be there. Wherever there's a cop beating up a guy, I'll be there. I'll be in the way guys yell when they're mad. And when the people are eating the stuff they raise and living in the houses they build, I'll be there too. We both got carried away with emotion because we were so built up with it that both of us as actors knew that we mustn't let ourselves go because that would be very bad so that the emotion was working for us and we had to hold it back, keep it in rain. Ford instinctively knew that this could happen, but it might not happen if we blew it too many times in rehearsals. Fonda and Jane Darwell might have held back tears, but they were the only ones. Everyone on set was crying, even John Ford. The Grapes of Wrath is perhaps the most unglamorous film of the Hollywood studio era. Turns out, alongside the glitz, audiences wanted a little reality. When they finally got to see the movie in 1940, they loved it. And now, at last, The Grapes of Wrath captures all the drama, suspense, action, tears and laughter of the story that stirred a nation. Despite all the controversy surrounding the movie, the film became a massive hit, 20th Century Fox's highest grossing film of 1940. When the Oscar nominations came, The Grapes of Wrath racked up seven, including Best Picture, Best Actor, and Best Director. Ford, by the way, also had a second film in the running, The Long Voyage Home, with six nominations. On February 27, 1941, Hollywood royalty made their way into the Biltmore Hotel for the ceremony. This is the night of thrills in Hollywood. Bob Hope, Jimmy Stewart, Ginger Rogers, they all showed up. When it came time for the Best Director Award, presenter Frank Capra made a bizarre choice. He asked the nominated directors to come on stage. The other nominees, Alfred Hitchcock, William Wyler, George Cukor, and Sam Wood all walked up, shook hands, and took a bow. Then Capra opened the envelope. The Oscar goes to John Ford, which must have made it incredibly awkward for everyone else on that stage because John Ford was the only nominee not there. Where was he? Out on the open sea on his beloved Ariner with fellow nominee Henry Fonda, who was up for Best Actor. When Ford got back to shore, he had only one thought about his Oscar win. My greatest disappointment is that Henry Fonda gave a great performance. He was nominated for the Academy Award, but didn't receive it. I received it, but the fact that Henry didn't get it took some of the elation, some of the joy away from me. They gave a great performance. 1941 
wasn't the only time Ford dodged the Oscars. Ford hated all ceremonies, all premieres, all that Hollywood pomp. He told Catherine Hepburn as much. No middle premiere or <laughs> yes, never, right. went, never went to an Academy Award. You never win. No. I didn't care where my name was or anything else. He wouldn't have gone to an Oscar ceremony at gunpoint, you know. Somebody else would pick up the award for him and give him the awards. Again, that's Scott Iman. Now, did he put the awards in storage? No, he was proud of those Academy Awards. But that's a different thing from going there and, and, and showing people <laughs> that you want that award, you know? Of course he wanted the award. He wanted to win. But he didn't want to be seen to want to win. Skipping the Oscars, even as he won more and more, that was so John Ford. Admitting he wanted awards would be way too vulnerable for a man who wanted to be seen as above it all. Ford skipped the Academy Awards ceremony again in 1942, a year after The Grapes of Wrath. This time, though, he had a better excuse. His movie, How Green Was My Valley, won five Oscars that year, including Best Picture beating Orson Welles' debut film, Citizen Kane, which was written by my grandfather, Herman Mankiewicz. Ford also won Best Director that year, his third, the last two coming back to back. No director had ever done that before. Daryl F. Zanuck accepted the Oscar for Ford. I would like to say that first of all, this is getting to be a habit of accepting wards that justly belong to Commander Ford. That's right, Commander Ford. 20th Century Fox is indeed proud of Commander Ford, who is tonight on a ship somewhere in the Far East. While John Ford never admitted to caring about movies, he openly, frequently, praised the military, said serving in the military was the only thing he truly cared about. And now, finally, he was officially working for the Navy. Just a few months before that Oscar ceremony, John Ford's wife, Mary, came to Washington, D.C. to visit him. He'd moved there as part of his naval service. While in D.C., the Ford family was invited to the home of Rear Admiral Andrew Pickens for an early Sunday afternoon dinner. We have a rare recording of John's wife, Mary, talking about this dinner. We were all sitting in this lovely old house. Admiral Pickens was an active duty and very much involved with security. As they sat down to eat, the telephone rang. The maid left the room to answer it, and quickly came back with the phone in her hand. She held it out to Admiral Pickens. She said, it's for you, Animal. She always called the Admiral Animal. And uh, he said, didn't you tell him I was dinner? She said, yes, sir, but they said that that didn't make any difference. It was very important. And he said, well, I like the nerve. And she said, that's the war department. Admiral Pickens took the phone from the maid and began listening to urgent news coming from the other end of the line. The date, December 7th, 1941. The Admiral began to nod vigorously. And yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. And he hung up and he said, there's been an attack by the Japanese on Pearl Harbor. Gentlemen, we are now at war. Everybody at that table, their whole life changed. Everybody at that table, their whole life changed, Mary said. I ask that the Congress declare that a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Next time on The Plot Thickens, 
John Ford made his way directly to the front lines of World War II's biggest battles. Casualties in this mammoth operation may reach a dreadful toll. The cameramen were coming ashore with the soldiers in the assault craft, taking the same risks. To get the perfect shot, Ford risked his life and disobeyed orders. It was really bad, an utter, complete slaughterhouse. I mean, like a shrapnel wounds in my elbow and shoulder, and knocked unconscious. But perhaps Ford's greatest accomplishment during the war vanished without a trace. I have been looking and looking for this film, and I have never found anything. Angela Carone is our director of podcasts. Story editor is Karen Duffin. Yako Friedman is our senior producer. Script writing by Yako Friedman, Maya Croth, and James Sheridan, who also fact-checked every episode for us. Audio editing and sound design by Brandon Arnold, James Kim, and Mike Volgaris. Mixing by Glenn Matullo. Research by Matt Goldberg. Production support from Liz Winter, Allison Fire, Matthew Ownby, Julie Baton, Emma Morris, Susan Bisak, Dory Stegman, and Phil Richards. Thanks to our legal team, John Renault and Kristen Hassel. And to the talents of TCM staffers, Taryn Jacobs, Katie Daniels, David Byrne, Diana Bosch, Caroline Wigmore, Michelle Height, Stephanie Thames, and to our resident Ford scholar, Scott McGee. Our executive producer is Charlie Tavish. Special thanks to Dan Ford for sharing his family archive with us and to the helpful team at Indiana University's Lilly Library. Special thanks to Christina Jensen from the De Gaulier Library at Southern Methodist University. From Novel, thanks to producer Philippa Goodrich, story editor Veronica Simmons, researcher Valeria Rocca, assistant producer Nadia Mehdi, production managers Cherie Houston and Charlotte Wolf, executive producer Max O'Brien, and creative director Willard Foxton. Thomas Avery of Tune Welders composed our theme music. I'm your host, Ben Mankiewicz. Thanks for listening. See you next time.